What's happening, Polite Society? I hope you had a good week. This month I had the honor and the privilege of being able to interview my friend and dear brother in the Lord, Dr. Scott Callahan. In this segment from that interview, Dr. Callahan responds to the shellfish argument sometimes made by gay apologists. The first subject that we'd like to talk about has to do with a dangerously growing movement right now within Christendom, and that is the great, not great, that is the gay Christian movement. This mm-hmm. movement is led by popular teachers like Matthew Vines and Brandon Robertson. There are also a number of leading scholars in the group, including Dr. James Brownson and Dr. Daniel Kirk. One argument which some gay apologists frequently use is what is sometimes referred to as the shell fish argument. Mm-hmm. It goes something like this. You evangelicals are inconsistent. You condemn homosexual practice using Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. But in that same book, you are prohibited from eating shellfish, shrimp, and pigs, and you are not allowed to mix two different kinds of cloth together or plant two different types of seed in the same field. Why do you condemn same-gender unions while breaking these other laws? How should we respond to this objection? Mm. Well, um, there are many very capable responses that apologists have given to this particular line of approach in uh, talking about this issue. And when generally when you hear these apologists speak, a common factor is that they bring up that in the Pentateuch, in the Torah, there are ceremonial, civil, and moral laws. And the thing is, what I haven't heard, now maybe, maybe people have given a capable explanation of this. And so, you know, please, I'm not, you know, the originator of some great new idea here. But what I haven't heard is an explanation of why it's okay to say that. In other words, to, I think, to me, for a non-Christian to hear, okay, look, there are ceremonial, civil, and moral laws in the Pentateuch. And because we're not ancient Israel, we don't apply the civil laws today. And because of Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross, we don't use the ceremonial laws in church. However, we preserve the moral laws because they're moral teaching. I think to non-Christian ears, that sounds like a really convenient way to dismiss scripture <laughs> mm-hmm. rather yeah. than deal with it, you know, in, in a serious manner. And um, so that response, I think, is not a full orb response. It's true, but why is it true is, is the point. Now, we step back just for a moment, and I think that the line of attack there saying, you Christians eat shrimp and pork, therefore you're hypocrites, therefore you don't take the Bible seriously, is, the, is, is more of a satirical attack than an actual Bible-based reasoning kind of engagement yep. so it's it's satire you know and and you've seen satirical clips about this o- online about shrimp eating and so forth so we get to the issue though and, and we do need to talk about it about why it's okay to talk about these different categories of laws so there is a thought process we go through and this thought process requires some greater engagement with the bible and it's most helpful when there's the willingness to engage at length, and it's helpful when there's some degree of biblical literacy (laughs) in the conversation, rather than just slinging satire, which is that, you know, line of approach. Okay, so first thing I think we need to recognize is that all peoples must respond to the Holy Spirit's call to faith in Christ. That is the new covenant teaching of the Bible. Now, what is this new covenant? It's a covenant that was announced in the prophets of the Old Testament, and and it's realized, and it's developed in the New Testament for us. Um, Many of us are are Gentiles, but some of us are Jews in the church. Everybody comes to faith and and relationship with uh, our Creator God through Christ, through the action of the Holy Spirit on our hearts calling us to repentance. Everybody. So there's no weaseling out of anything in the Bible for anybody for whom the, the, the Bible is the word of God. You know, the Bible is the word of God. So we don't just casually dismiss with what sounds like it's not, but what sounds like an ad hoc argument. So we need to lay that out at the beginning. The Bible is authoritative and sufficient 
for everybody. And this should be the consistent message of the church. There shouldn't be some people in the church who take a different stance on this. This is a, a foundational belief. So that's the first thing. So secondly, after we've established that we're new covenant believers, we come at that end of salvation history, not at towards the beginning. We're at the new covenant end. We need to recognize, well, new covenant is defined in relationship with the so-called old covenant in the Bible. What is that old covenant? Well, the Bible itself tells us we don't have to guess, okay? So we go to uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, and if I can, I'd like to read from the Legacy Standard Bible. Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will cut a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I cut with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, but I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. Yahweh. So th this is defining, it's about to define the new covenant in opposition to this old covenant, which is the Sinai covenant. That's important. And it's also important to note that Jeremiah says that covenant is broken. Okay, so 33. But this is the covenant which I will cut with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law in them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is very huge covenant language here. And then 34, and they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, No, Yahweh, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So this is a new covenant that's coming. It's announced Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, the prophets are announcing it, but it hasn't been actualized yet in their time. So it's a little bit special from an Old Testament perspective because it never comes about in the Old Testament. So then we get to the New Testament, and Hebrews tells us that this new covenant of Jeremiah is the new covenant that the New Testament is about. And it's interesting, it's not just Hebrews. So we can go to Hebrews 8, 8 to 11, and see a repeat of what we just read, basically. We can uh, look at Hebrews 9, 15, Hebrews 12, 24, where uh, the author says that Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. So it's, it, it couldn't be more clear that what the prophets announced has been fulfilled in Christ. And Hebrews isn't the only book. Uh, Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 3, 2 to 3, it, this is the intro, you know, to his letter. You are our letter, having been written on, in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested, that you're a letter of Christ, ministered to by us, having been written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of hearts, of flesh. That language says new covenant right there for a biblically literate reader. So Paul is just assuming the Corinthians are going to get that when he, when he writes in that really artful way. So these Gentiles are new covenant believers and they know it. So that's important. Okay, so we've established now the Sinai covenant is the so-called old covenant that the new covenant in the prophets and then in the New Testament is compared and contrasted with. It's an improvement for several reasons, Hebrews says, and one of the wonderful things about it is that Christ is the mediator. Okay, broken covenant. So when the line of argumentation, the satire about shrimp attacks Christianity, attacks the Bible about why don't you Christians eat shrimp, just the first thing to remember is this is material that appears in a broken covenant. So in the, in the legislation of broken covenant. So we need to say, what does that mean then? Okay, so that raises the question of interpretation because it appears in the broken covenant in a different way than if a covenant were in force. Okay, so Sinai covenant is not in force. So how, do, how should Christians now take the material of the Sinai covenant? Well, we don't discard it. See, that's, that's the, the misconception is because the covenant's broken, then we don't have to deal with it at all. This is the, the very egregiously wrong idea that we need to unhitch from the Old Testament 
any way you want to say that <laughs> is bad. <laughs> so, you know, from now on in history, I think that's going to get brought up every time the importance of the Old Testament comes up as a subject. This is Holy Scripture. It's three quarters of the canon for Christians, and it was the only Bible of the early church. Okay, that, that's an Old Testament professor talking there. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so, so next step is we're developing this ongoing logic about what do we do with the, the shellfish argument. The, the next idea, okay, since we're dealing with legislation of broken covenant, is laws implicitly require conditions upon which they apply. <laughs> okay, so the speed limit sign means nothing to someone who's walking. Hmm. And, you know, that, that kind of thing. The details of tax laws have initial conditions that apply to those who pay taxes. If you don't pay taxes, the law doesn't apply to you, this, this kind of thing. So as we mentioned, okay, strictly speaking, the breaking of the Sinai Covenant means the conditions of the Sinai Covenant don't exist anymore. And so the conditions are what? Well, you know, the people of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai is one of the conditions. We're, we're not them. Okay. But we don't, again, we don't just dismiss all of this scripture because that's the case. But we recognize that. Here's the thing, though. These civil laws, meaning laws for ancient Israel, are not meant then to be sort of deleted from our functional canon. The civil laws grant us like a window into the mind of God for faithful community living under his sovereignty. So there's moral content in these civil laws that we don't necessarily apply in the same way. So we study and apply these laws in accordance with new covenant conditions. So, I mean, just an example is the civil law, so to speak. If we have to put it in a civil ceremony or, or moral category, the primary one would be civil. In Deuteronomy 22, 8, is like this. It says, when you build a new house, you shall make a parapet, so like a safety rail, for your roof so that you'll not bring blood guilt on your house if anyone falls from it. Okay, well, th this is a, a, a guideline, a procedure, a regulation that strictly speaking, is this civil law that there's not really a penalty attached to it, except for saying there's going to be blood guilt on your house. Well, that that then activates a whole bunch of, of other Pentateuch legislation if you have blood guilt on you. You know, there's there's a sin to be atoned for and, and, and so forth. Okay, okay. You can, you can see this civil law has moral purposes and you, you want to protect your guests you know people at the house you know don't fall off the roof just yesterday i'm walking home and i'm seeing some buildings being re-shingled and thankfully the workers on this steep grade roof were had safety lines going up so they wouldn't fall okay so take care of people <laughs> you know take reasonable precautions to take care of people is definitely we can see a moral implication of that civil law Okay, so next step, we've, we've kind of talked about the civil laws and how they apply, but not just the same way because the conditions are different in the new covenant, okay? So next, kind of put civil laws to the side. How about ceremonial laws? So, you know, ritual purity kind of things, um, sacrifices for atonement and so forth. Well, as for priestly laws, we can demonstra demonstrate from scripture how Jesus fulfills every aspect of the priestly system. We don't want people to get the impression that it's sort of a throwaway line, that Jesus fulfills the old covenant. Well, he does, but sometimes you need more to kind of demonstrate, no, in detail, he does. So what, <laughs> what, are, we, what are we talking about when we say he fulfills every aspect of the priestly system? Well, he's our priest. He is the uh, atoning sacrifice himself, and he is, so to speak, the location of atonement. He's everything about bringing atonement to us for our sin. Uh, and as Hebrews has made clear in talking about he's the media mediator, there's nothing further to be done. Jesus has done it all. So some scripture to help us see that is Ephesians 5, 1 to 2, which reads, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, 
and walk in love, just as Christ also loved us and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So very clear, Christ is our sacrifice. And that fragrant aroma kind of language is directly connecting that uh, what, what Christ has done to atoning sacrifices in the Old Testament. It couldn't be more clear, especially to uh, people who are steeped in Old Testament scripture. So Jesus is the sacrifice, point one. So point two, Hebrews 10, 11 to 12. Jesus is the high priest who makes the atoning sacrifice. This is what, what it says. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. So it has to be continually done. But he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. And the argument continues there in Hebrews. But Jesus is the one who offers the atoning sacrifice. He offers himself. But he is the sacrifice, and he is the priest who offers the sacrifice. And then thirdly, Romans 3, 23 to 25, says that Jesus, so to speak, is the place of the atoning sacrifice. So that'll become more clear in a moment. And this is part of a really long sentence. So I'm only reading part of the long sentence. Romans 3, 23 to 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith for a demonstration of his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. So the propitiation word right there, Christ is the propitiation. The Greek word is hilasterion. So what does that mean? Hilasterion in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, interestingly, is the atonement cover of the ark, which in Hebrew is kaporet. So this is a translational equivalent situation. This propitiation word is the place that this act of propitiation and atonement happened in the priestly work on the Day of Atonement of, of putting the blood on the atonement cover of the ark. So this is difficult to say in a translation. So this is why some translations will not have the propitiation word there, and we'll try to render it some other way. But I've never uh, seen it a Bible translation where in the translation itself, maybe in a footnote, but in the translation itself, it says, this is the atonement cover word, okay? So to review, the Bible says in these New Testament passages, Jesus is the priest, he is the atoning sacrifice, and he is the place that the offering takes place. So he's everything. Jesus has done it all. As 1 Peter 3.18 says, for Christ also suffered for sins once for all. It's done. The righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring you to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So that, that's a little more then of why we can say with confidence that Christ has fulfilled all the atoning priestly functions of the Old Testament law. And that's why they're not animal sacrifices today, you know, because the reference to the shellfish could then go on and say, why don't you uh, get out and slaughter some lambs today, you know, for your sins. Okay, so now we come to moral laws. We've dealt with ceremonial, sorry, civil, then ceremonial, now moral laws. Well, I mean, of course, we have the New Testament's attitude recorded towards these moral laws. Uh, all the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, interestingly, except for one. Commandment number four about keeping the Sabbath. And there are theological reasons for this, but here's an affirmation of nine of the Ten Commandments, which are a cornerstone of what? The broken Sinai covenant. So that's the New Testament attitude toward this, towards this broken covenant. It's filled with good. It's filled with material that has really direct application, the Ten Commandments, and 
an application that may differ from the original one, but is consistent with the spirit of the original application in the Pentateuch, in the Torah. So there's that. Um, there's no need to repeat everything that's being affirmed because really most of the material of the Sinai covenant is being affirmed. It's just assumed in the New Testament that the undergirding morality of God's requirements for his people remains the same. Now that morality is not to say that Christianity is a moral system, a discipline, so to speak. As uh, I, I prayed before we begin, we acknowledge we are all sinners. We fall short of the glory of God. This is Old Testament teaching as well as New Testament teaching. We are not God. And that's, that's a realization that the sinful human being doesn't like to make, uh, to come to, you know. We are not God. But we are, because we're redeemed, we're part of a story that goes back to this biblical content we're talking about. There's such great unrecognized continuity between the Old and New Testaments. So here's an interesting point of discontinuity. The Jew Gentile separation laws. So now we come to the shellfish, okay? Specifically, the issues that are brought up, like, you know, don't eat shrimp, uh, wear clothes of only one fiber, not mixed fibers, don't sow two kinds of seed in the same field, you know, these kind of regulations. These, uh, meaning, don't do what the Gentiles do. You're, you're a special people for me you know, this, this kind of thing. Um, some of that uh, Jew-Gentile separation motive may be hidden to us that would have been obvious to the original reader. So we just acknowledge this is an important part of uh, some of these ceremonial laws. Um, they're all explicitly set aside now in the New Testament because the separation of peoples according to ethnicity no longer exists. That's to say, in the new covenant, people of God are both Jew and Gentile. It's faith in Christ that sets the people of God apart now. There are no dividing lines of ethnicity in the church. As Bodhi Bauckham has said, racial reconciliation is achieved. Hallelujah. In the church, okay, and and the, the sinful human being militates against that because um, there's the feeling of, well, non-Christians sh should be able to partake in this too. We can't. Only Christ can do this. And it's been done. It's so exciting in the Bible. So, he, I mean, here's, for instance, Ephesians 2, 13 to 16. But now in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles, who, are formerly, uh, who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, one and broke down the dividing wall of the partition, which God set up. <laughs> okay, so this isn't some, you know, Jews were racists. No, 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 no. God set that up for the glorification of his holy name, creating a covenant people for himself to be a model for us who deserve nothing as Gentiles to come into relationship with the God of Israel, to be a model for us, okay? So um, broke down the dividing wall of partition by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, <laughs> okay, the civil law, so that in himself, Christ, he might create the two into one new man, making peace, this is the church, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, having in himself put to death the enmity. And, you know, we can keep on, you know, with this exciting material, but, you know, I'm just, I'll just use that selection. All right. So the Jew-Gentile separation material, that's, that's set aside now. That, that's an important thing to say. And it's explicitly set aside. It's not because we want it to be set aside. It's the Bible says, okay? And then on the specific issue of homosexuality, which is often the motivating reason in our current era for bringing this subject up, although it need not be. There could be many other reasons for satirizing why Christians don't eat pork, okay, or, or shrimp. But 
um, about homosexuality, the prohibition against homosexuality, it's explicitly affirmed in the New Testament over and over again. And this, it's important to say that because there's, um, among liberal Protestants, mostly, there's a, a movement called Red Letter Christianity that you've dealt with on your program before, where it's assumed that the, the red letters in a, a red letter edition Bible, the words of Jesus hold more weight than anything else. Um, this is directly in contradiction to what scripture says about itself, let alone what the red letters say <laughs> about the red letters of scripture. So I mean, yeah. not even paying attention to what the red letters say. You know, there's yeah. some red letters that say some embarrassing things for red letter mm -hmm. Christianity. Okay, so kind of kind of focus on other, you know, the, the redder, <laughs> redder <laughs> letters. In my okay. experience, it was it's been um, some red letters are more equal than other red letters. <laughs> yes, yes, but it, it's it's kind of assumed, I think, in our day, just from what I've observed in all discussions of sexuality, that only the red letters count, but not in a way that takes the red letters seriously. You know, I mean, you, you can't just we we need to reject the idea that you can parcel off a canon within a canon of, of the Bible because the entire book is authoritative and sufficient. But then we don't, of course, then say that any single part that's been sectioned off is any less of a canon itself, the red letters. Okay, so the entire framework of God creating male and female in his image is assumed in Jesus's uh, preaching and he, he even brings it up, okay? So the, the idea that God whispers about sexual sin, um, I don't know how people who immerse themselves in the Bible can come to such a conclusion. Uh, where, where is the, um, where's the honoring of God's word in such a statement? And even if he did whisper, isn't God's whisper more important than anything I have to say? That's right. Yes. I mean, that, which, by the way, the Bible says that too. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the foolishness of God you know, versus the wisdom of man. But anyway, okay. Um, but sexual sin is emphasized in the Bible. It's even placed in its own particularly serious category, sins against one's own body, the temple, the Holy Spirit made in God's image. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 18. So look, um, this discussion to this point, that took a lot of time. It's not something that can be conveyed in an elevator speech, you know, and, and you have to gauge whether the person sitting next to you on the airplane is willing to listen <laughs> to, to such an exposition of um, the understanding of why it is that even though we are new covenant believers united to the God of Israel through faith in Christ. We, the, the old covenant's broken. It's, it's not for us in the way of regulating our relationship with God, determining it, defining it, any of that. But it's filled with meaning for us for all kinds of reasons, for exactly what it says, for its application in the New Testament and its contribution to Old Testament theology, New Testament theology, because it's New Testament background, biblical theology, and systematic theology. We could not understand God's will for us if we did not have the Torah. It's the foundation of everything. And that we get that from Jesus, too. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the, um, I, th I think a thing to, to say at this point is, um, we just we just thank God for His grace for making His His will for us so clear in His Word because we would never find it on our own on the issue of whether Christians should uh, value and in fact obey the Old Testament. It's the same question as whether or not we should follow Jesus. The answer is yes, you know, but just how we do it. You know, we, we need a whole Bible approach that honors every aspect of God's revelation to us. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like the content here, you can subscribe by clicking on the icon on the bottom right. 
then you can hit the bell for notifications. I upload a new video every Wednesday and every Saturday. I provided links to Dr. Callahan's work in the video description below. Have an awesome week, and for my brothers and sisters in the Lord, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all always. I will see you all in the next video. God's blessings on your week.